Now, I've been adapting on our farm all my farming life, <clears throat> but it wasn't really until the millennium drought or the late 90s that I started to uh, think more about adapting for climate change rather than um, adapting for uh, economic or production issues, which was what we normally adapt for. And that's not to say that we don't continue that process. It's kind of a mixed process now, and in many ways, when we get the production better, we quite often get a climate outcome as well. Our farm is a mixed farming and cropping farm, and it has uh, also a, a sheep enterprise. We started in the 70s when I came home from college, um, looking at the erosion issues and soil structure and things like that. Um, and so we went to uh, direct drilling that moved into uh, stubble retention. And then we went different varieties, you know, grazing cereals, did a lot of work with um, plant industries out of CSIRO over the last 25 years. So a lot of what we've done is, uh, I should point out, is very much a collaborative effort between enormous numbers of people, uh, researchers, scientists, all sorts of people. We just, we kind of just devour ideas whether, wherever we can find them. I notice uh, Mr. Prattley sitting up there, Dr. Prattley. Uh, uh, he he uh, taught me everything I know, so you can blame him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we, we, we moved on, and, and these days we're still doing, uh, sort of building on our adaption, but we, we're starting to grow more hardier crops as the weather changes, and we're, I've never grown much barley before. It's, more, it's been a crop that's grown further west, but that's coming into our area now as well as it dries out. On the livestock side, we've had a view that um, we've invested in um, better genetics, and again, that comes from the work that the MLA does with uh, sheep genetics and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's allowed us to um, move to shearing every eight months. There are people that shear every six months, but we find eight fits into our cropping program uh, more easily. Uh, it also means that we don't have to crutch anymore, so we, we save that. Uh, the sheep tend to do better. Our, stocking, uh, our lambing rates have gone up <clears throat> because of uh, not carrying wool and um, generally being in better condition. So they're the sort of um, things that we're doing. So you've got all those sorts of adaption, different machinery type stuff. I'll talk more about that. Now, you see from this graph that we've had various um, um, changes or major adaptions across industries. This is a graph done by Dr. John Angus and Dr. John Kierkegaard. But it flattens out, if I can get this thing to work. Maybe not. Oh yes, it flattens out there in the late 2000 and sort of 2000 period. Uh, now, at, at, at wheat yields have stagnated at this time, and even with further adaption, I'm not sure that we're going to get very far. We've, we've moist, what I'm saying is we've basically taken all the low-hanging fruit out of um, cropping adaption. You know, we've, we've gone moisture conservation. There was a time when we actually tried to grow fodder rape during the summertime in our area to use up the moisture because it was so uh, moist back in the uh, 80s. Uh, but that's changed considerably. Now we're trying to save every drop we can get. And the bigger problem is the late, um, the increasing temperatures in the late, um, the late spring, which is seriously affecting our yields. And from Stephen's talk, we can see how the frosts are increasing, getting later, and we're having to get our crops to finish earlier, and that puts us in a fairly tight sort of a bind at times. Now this is all an issue because um, in the early 90s, back at the bottom of that, over here, wherever, where is 90s, back here where this took off, it was estimated we were getting 35% of our potential yield we were actually getting in the bin. And over the last 20 years to 2015, we've lifted that up to 55%, even though uh, climate has had an impact, and it is expected that we might be able to get it up to 80, 85%. 
So, and it's usually thought that we will get around 22 kilograms of grain for every millimetre of rain that falls. So that leaves us in a worrying situation because if rainfall continues to decrease and we can only get to 80 per cent, it's likely that uh, the yields will stagnate even further and that will, will make um, cropping extremely difficult. Now wheat farm, it should be noted that um, some areas will benefit and some won't. I live in on, the, on the slopes country, southwest slopes, just not far from here at Harden. And it's possible in areas like that or maybe the wetter areas down near Geelong, uh, which have struggled to grow crops because of too much rain, they'll benefit. And pretty much I suspect anywhere that can still grow crops will benefit because um, economics, as we saw before, plays a very big impact. And as, as uh, yields decline, prices tend to rise. And so we might be able to just get a small get out, get out of jail card if we're able to continue to uh, produce. But there's going to be large areas of the wheat belt which I suspect will become unproductive. <clears throat> this also affects livestock industries in many ways, excessive temperature causing lower growth of pastures, lower growth rates of the animals, and maybe even cause death if, if um, heat waves are too long and too high. And the concept of preparing for droughts or rain deficiencies as they are now called in New South Wales is becoming considerably harder as the climate becomes more extreme. And we're sort of seeing an example of that this week in Queensland where the guys up there have been dealing with drought for a couple of years and they've destocked. And I was reading in the land last month how they thought they'd be destocked by the end of March. Now they've had all the rain, they'll all have to rush out to expensive markets and restock again. I dare say they can only do that so many times before it becomes pretty futile. Now, whilst adaption is absolutely necessary, I don't believe it's the core issue, which is now anthrop anthropogenic global warming, and that is human-induced global warming. Um, and that's impacting our climate systems. And if we continue in this manner of, of believing that we can adapt our way out of the problem, I think we're being... Um, somewhat self-delusional. Now before I go on, I'll just clarify the definitions that I'm going to use today. Now, they come from a, uh, um, a lady, Karen O'Brien, which some of you may know, and that's her website. Basically, adaption is generally involves changing of something into something, or in response to something. So we had soil erosion issues, so we changed our sewing system to become um, more efficient. Um, transformation, the contrast involves changing from something into something completely different. So you might be a wheat farmer and you go into cropping, uh, you go into um, sheep. So what we're trying to do in all of that is avoid risk, as we've pointed out here before. And as responsible farmers managing a farming business, we're actively engaged in risk management. And if you take nothing else away from today's discussion, I'd like you to consider that the impact of anthropogenic global warming is, it's in, and its inherent climate change at the farm gate level is a problem of risk management. It is through risk management that we are adapting to change. Actually, on the farm, this means being flexible in what we grow, using technology to get as good a forecast of the futures as we can get, and as risks rise, cutting costs where we can. Right, as you can see from both adaption and transformation involves change. However, transformation involves changing something more, is more than just a physical change. And I think fundamentally it's about thinking about changing the way we think. For the first time in human history, climate change is not some random occurrence that happens to us to which we adapt, such as when the ice ages occurred, people just did what they could because they didn't have any information. But now it's something that we have a conscious control over. As humanity, we can choose to reduce emissions that cause the problem, as we're doing at the moment, or we can increase, as we were doing, or we can increase the emissions as we're doing now. And surely I hear you say, 
that we're not consciously choosing them. Well, consider this. Anthropogenic global warming is pretty much settled as a science. It's been known about for 150 years, and there isn't too much debate about the fact that the globe is warming. And I think we've agreed that it's gone up by nearly one, per one degree at the moment. What we're really arguing about is how that warming is changing our client climate and where it'll change it and what impacts that'll have. It could mean moving to drought tolerant crops or more livestock in the mix and as I hope in our area we'll, we'll get out of jail but I think marginal areas might have to transform and this could cause considerable dislocation to rural areas <coughs> um, and of course you've got an overlay over all of this of economics, land values, prices, any one of these things could cause uh, a serious problem. Might I suggest that the place to start in transforming our thinking about climate change is by getting serious about anthropogenic global warming and the greenhouse gases that drive the emissions. Now that's a, that's a uh, slide which many of you will be seen before. It's uh, greenhouse gas emissions by CO2 by sectors of the Australian economy. It doesn't really matter what the uh, percentages are. Or for this argument, I just want you to recognise the sort of the relative sizes. Uh, you've got energy and stationary emissions accounting for 60 plus percent, including transport. And you've got agriculture roughly around 19 percent. And half of the agriculture's emissions is roughly emissions from livestock. So, and that's the growth of emissions over time for each industry. And in agriculture, you'll see, is the red line running across the bottom there. It hasn't changed much from 1990. I suspect that's been <coughs> a bit of adaption through farmers using um, direct drilling and using less diesel and things like that. But probably one of the biggest impacts was the collapse in the floor price scheme for wool and the low, in, uh, low livestock prices. So for pretty much of this period of time, livestock haven't been doing that well, so people have cut them back and gone into cropping. It's likely here that there'll be another kick up because everybody's going back into sheep. But at the same time, energy and transport have continued to increase massively. Now, what I'm trying to show here is that it's not like we don't know what we're doing and we don't have the ability to make changes and we're actually making a choice. In 1990, government decided to start talking about a, an ETS scheme and the mere fact that they talked about it caused it to fall. They then brought in the carbon tax for ETS and it collapsed down to here, which is where we wanted it to go, and then, then our wondrous leaders decided to get rid of that, and it's gone back up. It's actually above where it was in 1990. So we are, in fact, choosing, we being the, peop you know, the general public, not individually, but if we keep choosing this, that's the picture of the tundra up in northern Russia in the Arctic. <clears throat> As it melts, it falls off. And whilst we may be able to choose to, to adapt and make changes now, if we don't do that quick enough, and that was the point of the little joke at the start, because I think this problem is very much like fighting bushfires, to be successful we're going to have to be decisive and quick. And if we just wait too long we get into these feedback loops and it may not be possible to, um, to take the action that we need. So on a, on, on my farm and many Australian farms, we are adapting via a new technology and we're using a lot of data and such like. Now that's a picture of um, uh, moisture meters on our farm. Uh, they're in real time, so I took that picture on the 23rd of February. Uh, what it shows you is the rainfall uh, as, it, as it occurs and how it enters the soil. They're in 20 centimetre sections. And how we're using that is that, for simple reasons, when it gets below 100 mils, the crop starts to suffer. And it goes down about three to four mils a day if you don't get any rain in the spring. 
So we would normally put out urea about here last year, and we'd normally put different chemicals and insecticides and fungicides, all sorts of things. But we got to there and it's starting to suffer and there wasn't any rain forecast, so we didn't put that on. So then it collapsed completely. And what that sort of innovation allows us to do is save a lot of costs. Unfortunately, what it didn't do, we were about, the crop was about ready to harvest here, and it got that, and it got um, seriously um, um, weather damage. But interestingly enough, there's always a good side in farming, I love it. We actually got pretty much the same amount of money for wrecked wheat this year as we got the week before, the year before for good wheat. <laughs> so go figure that. So, you know, we will, um, no, sorry. Whilst we must continue to invest in adapt adaptive techniques, as they may give us um, the time to make the required changes, we mustn't be seduced by the idea that this is the answer. And, um, you know, like I can go to any number of field days and there's all sorts of talks on adaption and, and you know, there's, there's a huge body of information, more research coming out every day about adaption. Unfortunately, I think um, people think that we'll be able to adapt our way out of this problem. Um, I think there are so many aspects of this problem that um, we really need to start thinking about transforming our thinking on it. Sure, the farmers will keep doing what they can, but they are not going to solve it by themselves. We need to transform our thinking and act decisively on fossil fuel emissions. And that doesn't have to be, like you all would have seen, or some of you would have seen the Four Corners report last night talking about housing collapses. Uh, we don't have to do these things um, tomorrow if we start now, but if we don't do it for 20 years, we probably are going to have to do them pretty smartly, and that's when the pain's really going to set in. So we need to act decisively, and we need to stop emissions before it gets too bad. Otherwise, we might get ourselves into a feedback loop that we can't actually solve. And the bottom line is the choice is ours or yours or however you like to describe it. But we do have the, best, the capacity to make the changes if we have the will and the desire to do it. Thank you.